We've got to re-involve low achievers at a higher level of expectation. When you ask these teachers to think about this, how did, you, how did the perceived lows react to more frequent response opportunities? I told you about Rodney. He was shocked, absolutely shocked. He actually began to pay attention. Because for the first time, I was probably the first teacher in, he was a ninth grader at that time, probably, we usually turn them off about third grade. By the time they hit third grade, we convinced them that they're not capable of learning. Not because we're bad people, just because of the way we behave and sort people. So I asked these teachers, you've done this for a couple weeks, how did they react? Rodney got more involved. As a whole, these two schools that I worked with in Charlotte said the same thing. These low achievers who haven't done a thing for me all year began to do some things. Now, if you go backslide after I leave, none of this is any good. What are the reactions of the perceived highs? They're jealous and resentful. You're taking their time. And you don't do that. How do you, how, how do you keep them involved? Is let them help you teach. Let them demonstrate. Let them take the teachable moment and run with it. They will learn just in that process. I mean, I you know Stephen Covey wrote Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I had the opportunity to see him speak in person one day, and at the end of the session, we've been there all day long listening to habits. And he said, Now, your challenge is to go tell seven people what I just taught you. you if you don't, you'll forget everything I've told you. We remember, I don't remember the numbers, maybe Dr. McKinney, we remember 30% of what we hear. We remember 95% of what we teach. So if you want a high achiever to learn more, let them teach. Let the middle achiever teach. We also all let the low achiever teach once we get them to, to believe they can do it. If we can remember 95% of what we teach, why are we doing all the talking? If we all remember 30% of what we hear, we got a lot of air coming out that's not staying. You need to go talk about Tessa after the day, either with each other or somebody else, or your mom and daddy or your grandma or somebody. Say, so let me tell you what I heard today. See if this makes sense. And do that seven times. Equal distribution, proximity, and all these key words, they become part of your vocabulary. Stephen Covey was right. Because you can begin to talk about those things. So we asked them, did proximity offer any challenges to your teaching style? Well, the arrangement of the room is one challenge. If you're used to standing here as the leader of the class, it's a challenge to get around the room. So we said, well, if it's a challenge, and what, what, what happened as a result of that? Less discipline issues, more attention, more engagement. You, feel, you actually feel, begin to feel better about yourself. To me, it's less tiring to walk around and talk than it is to stand in one spot. My joints are all wet. My nails aren't good. Stand still, they start to mash together. Individual help. Help may or may not be solicited by the student. Uh, we were looking at what to look for the next time we go in. Help can be, be nonverbal. You don't have to just record things that are, that are spoken. Basis of action. Most teachers make frequent use of praise to encourage students and reinforce desired performance. Research shows that high achievers receive the most teacher praise. Low achievers are less apt to be praised than highs giving a right answer. Who said that? Researchers. It was not an emotional all of a sudden came to an awareness. They went out and observed and coded and collected the data. There are exceptions, but as a whole, that's what happens. The main reason we don't, in our own mind, we don't think that low achiever can understand our praise. If I'm going to talk about the benefit for lifelong learning as it contributes to building and scaffolding of skills and developing critical thinking skills, well, if I tell Rodney that, he won't have a clue what I'm saying. He won't the first time, but he will the tenth time. Especially after you've explained it to him what that 
that language of learning culture is all about. Praise rather than punishment is a great concept, but not if it results in students thinking they're doing satisfactory work when they aren't. That's a strong comment. I had a hard time dealing with that when I first heard it. If we tell somebody they've given us a good answer, and we even give them a reason for it being a good answer, and it's not really a good answer, we reinforce non-learning. So we have to be honest about it. And you don't do that when I say, no, that's not right. You've got to give a better answer. You do it in a way say, well, let's get, that's getting you started. Let's think a little bit deeper into that. Let's look at this concept a little differently and see if we can add something to that. It's just as incorrect to praise somebody when it's wrong than it is not to praise them when they're right. That's a hard thing to practice. We tend to sometimes want to get through. I've seen a lot of lessons taught at public school level, college level, where people have this, I'm going to do this, 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 and this. I've got a way to get through this time period. Thank goodness I've got my time figured out. I'm going to get through it, and that's it. And it saves them. And they're safe. But a lesson ought to be where you might want to stop at some point and reinforce a concept or redirect a concept. I was teaching volleyball one time when I was being observed in a, I told you all about Texas School in Tesla. We also did a thing called, uh, it had another acronym. I think I would have to leave here, but we had observers from the central office come in, and we is actually based on a lot of Madeline Hunter stuff, which Madeline Hunter was very scripted. I'm not a Madeline Hunter proponent. She wasn't either a proponent of herself. She says people misquoted her or misused her, but she had some good concepts. But anyway, I was teaching volleyball, and we had this thing in Madeline Hunter where you monitor and adjust. You, you do the learning, and if the learning's not occurring, you monitor that, and then you adjust what you're doing. So I was teaching this volleyball class and we were developing a skill where you set the volleyball for somebody to spike it, where our drill was to, to hit the volleyball and put it through the basketball goal so we had people all around. And it was, they were going everywhere. Balls were going into bleachers and backwards and none of them were going in the holes. So I just stopped the lesson and here's assistant superintendent sitting in the stands coding me and writing notes. So I stopped them and we revisited how to set a volleyball, which is your fingers have to be wide apart, your hands have to be cupped, and there has to be a thump rather than a, a thud rather than a slap. I mean, there's some principles. So we stopped, then we went back to trying to put the balls through the net. I got a perfect score from my evaluator, and I thought I'd failed the lesson because my kids couldn't do what they're supposed to do with the volleyball. She gave me a perfect score because I monitored and adjusted what was going on with that particular lesson as simple as volleyball may seem. How does that apply to reading and math and science or whatever you're teaching? And there's a point at which you stop. Who was at fault? Part of the boys were being silly, but part of it is I hadn't adequately taught them how to do that skill. So there's a point in time in which you haven't done the, the proper math skill to do the the objective itself, and we have to redo that. I'm going to speed up, but you, you've got copies of this. These are talking about what to do as you look at each other. What's the overall reflection from this? Is we change our individual habits, we change the way we plan to teach, we change the way we implement lessons, we change the way we assess not the kids, but us. Assess yourself. Changing collegiality. Create conversations about learning. Get better at what you learn, what you taught based on what you can learn from each other. And then we ask questions. Once you focused on it, did you find people needing more help? Did they ask for more help? Who's going to ask for it? High achievers at first. Then that equal distribution kicks in. You notice changing in attitudes. They did. If so, what changes? Just to look, let's say, just the looks on their faces as they were more involved. Not looking to get to throw spitballs or, or create a disturbance in the classroom. Now you spent weeks practicing targeted behaviors and you noticed positive change. Participation, less 
off-target behavior, more involvement. But ultimately, we didn't go back and get to this point. Did, did the achievement level improve? And not the achievement on a uh, standardized test, but did they demonstrate things to you that you think were important to them? That idea of waiting. Studies show that teachers tend to allow high achievers more time to answer a question than low achievers. When a low achiever hesitates, a teacher may anticipate no answer as an in, or, or an inadequate answer. Teachers do not wish to embarrass a student or waste time so the response opportunity is terminated. Make a learning opportunity out of it. If a low achiever cannot answer, help them, tell them, give more point, give more information that the whole class can hear and draw their attention to it. Class, let's listen to this as we walk through this. I would, when I used to observe teachers on a regular basis, I couldn't stand when a teacher was doing individual work and they went around to a student and they were giving some very good information. You know, if you go over here and, and, and look at this and move this over here and this, this, uh, this problem here, Bill, what did I say to her? That's a teachable moment. Class, listen to this. She just asked me a question. Here's my response. Let me see what you think about it. If you move this piece over here and this math problem is rewritten a little different way, what do you think? Now who have I helped? Everybody. So if I went to observe a teacher and she did that, and it happened, it would happen, no matter how many times you talked about it, I, we had a conversation after class. Don't just correct one student. Use that to help teach the rest of the class. Now, especially if that person is a low achiever and normally hasn't been involved in the lesson anyway, it's more, it gets everybody more involved. <coughs> the opportunity to demonstrate latency occurs more frequently when the teacher asks questions which require students to interpret or reorganize facts or to form an opinion rather than answer simple recall questions. There's some recall necessary. There are certain basic facts you have to have. That's not reinforcing the learning, getting beyond those recall answers to questions that help, that ask you to reorganize or interpret, stay with you. And I always like to say, can you repeat what we just said? And then go to another one and say, can you repeat what we just said? What are we doing? We're teaching what we know, not just listening to what we heard. Because we what? And I got the numbers wrong. I'm going to get the right numbers and send them to you. We remember 30% of what we hear, 95% of what we teach. That's Glasser, G-L-A-S-S-E-R. 95% of what we teach, we remember. We just got to make sure that we taught it the right way and we're saying the right thing. Allow us to see enough time to think the question over before terminating the response opportunity or attempting to assist the student. We were taught with the Madeline Hunter work five seconds, minimum five seconds. And then we were taught in Tessa, even five seconds elapsed, don't leave them. Delve into that. Reasons for praise. Often extended feedback will deal with the process involved in, in producing the desired result. Teachers usually provide process feedback if the process is used by a student is erroneous or, in, or inappropriate. We're less likely to provide process feedback when praising. Just think about this. When you practice your lessons, when you start teaching, if you're saying good, great, wonderful, over and over and over again, it really gets to mean very little to the student. You can still use it once a day or something or once a class, but don't overuse those one-word praises. Tell them why. Tie that into something that's a higher level of thinking. Relate that to what's coming next or what's scaffolded in that line. Uh, you're actually telling the students why their work is acceptable or praiseworthy. And if it's not, what do we do? We try to correct it so it gets praiseworthy, not tell them it's incorrect. Teachers less apt to provide clues or delve in answers with low cheer because the teacher suspects delving will be fruitless and fears the child will be embarrassed. They will at first, but if they get, if you got everybody in the building practicing these habits, it gets to be a way of learning, not a way of, of pointing at someone and saying, you can't learn. That's that language, culture, routine collaboration piece that we talk about codes.
Practices endure while programs evaporate. Your individual habits will sustain your ability to lead learning much longer than any reading program, math program, and, and even the techniques. Not that those things aren't important, but your practices will stay with you. So you just can't go do this and say, oh, this, that worked, that was fun. You have to get better at it, you refine it, you try to, to make sure it's part of your everyday routine. You're building that internal capacity, meaning you're building your ability to help others learn by what? Practicing behaviors that reinforce the learning. And in the last session, we basically went back and talked with them about what had happened over these uh, about three months' time. Students who are viewed as low achievers are given fewer opportunities to practice higher level thinking. Higher level questions are directed to students from whom a model answer is anticipated. It's changing. Dr. McKinney and all the people working with Teacher Ed are doing a much better job than they did 30 years ago when I came out. When I hired teachers as administrator, I could see differences in programs. I could see certain students who came out of certain schools, so there was something going on in terms of, of these practices in some places. And that's our goal, is to make sure we're on top of what's best and on top of what makes you more successful, more likely to be successful when you get out there in your teaching practice. Okay, this, this was more of a review from those teachers and that's, that's uh, six months and 67 minutes. Questions? Do you have any more handouts? Sorry? Do you have any more handouts? I brought 20, we can make some more, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll get it, I'll get it, I'll get it. Yes. Um, okay, this might be kind of too detailed question, um, but anyway, I can see how this sort of would work for like a social studies or a science or a math class. Um, I, I don't really quite, well, and this is the first time I've been exposed to TESA anyway, but how, how could this be applied to, say, a music classroom? Because I'm a music major, and uh, you know, I mean, it, would, it seems to be like it would be a little bit difficult in a music classroom to... I'm certainly not a musical person, but my thought is that that's more so than, than some of the other subjects you mentioned because music is about correct posture, correct uh, movement, correct note understanding and demonstration. Seems like to me that's like me teaching dance and PE. You're actually getting around. And you don't, every situation, every day, every minute you're not there, it's just during most of your. Uh, independent time kind of thing, but I see music being more structured to it than, than some of the others. And the expectation for, there's going to be some people who can play a trumpet, some people who can't, some people who can sing, and some people who can't sing as well. Same principles apply to the non-singer in terms of what we have to make sure we get out. And if you teach, if you were on my staff and I'm the principal, you're not going to get by with just teaching music. You're going to have to integrate math, and reading and other subjects into it. So you've got an opportunity to look at, and, and music is a fine example of fractions, obviously it's based on fractions. So you get an opportunity to reinforce what she's teaching in her math class and your music class, and you can do that by getting around with note charts and scales, and I don't know the language, I'm not, I'm totally not a music person. I've tried to take music lessons here, it doesn't work. <laughs> I, I learned a little bit. I just should have stayed with it. Did that? No, I don't know all the answers to that, but begin to think about, and, and I don't know what area of music you're in. When you said that, I'm thinking of a band class and I think of a choral class, and obviously there's opportunities to get around the room. And if there's five trumpets, I would think you'd want to get close to each trumpet to see specifics and maybe look at different individual skills. Anybody, anybody got an answer for that? I, I don't have all the answers. Anybody else musically inclined see some something that might help them understand that? We're going to collaborate. We're going to have some collaborative assessment. Excellent question. And we all ask that. How does that work for kindergarten? How does that work for uh, K-12? 
chemistry class. How does that work for science class? I mean, there's, you begin to ask that. But I had all mechanics, French, English, and math, and PE. So, I, and when you go back and look, and I've done this with faculties, and they begin to share, everybody gets some of those different, uh, just different degrees and different time frames. It might be 20 minutes of it for you and 60 minutes of it in another class. Not, you're not going to go in and become a, somebody's going to jog around the room the whole hour or hour and a half or whatever it is. There's still some of this to do. Hold on, let me tell you about fractions. I'll draw it up and get around. You didn't have a question? Good, I had a question. <laughs> I don't think she's not a learner. I'm going to get close to her. <laughs> well, thank you for your attention. I, I usually can judge a group that I'm in front of by the eye contact and their attention, and you've been wonderful. Uh, yeah, great. And I hope it meant something for you. And if it's 10 years down the road, I hope it clicks back in. I do urge you to go tell people about it and say, I may not, I don't necessarily buy all this stuff this fool said, but <laughs> here's what it's supposed to mean. I'd suggest you read a little bit on teacher expectations. And sure, I'm sure you're getting it in other places too, but it made a believer out of me. And if you want, if you got some time later on, I'll come back and talk about uh, managing difficult people and how it's about you, not them. <laughs>